Did you know that we had a KP5 the other day? Do you even know what that is? It's June 2023. Welcome to the Photo Focus Podcast. As always, I'm your co-host, Ron Pepper. I'm a Bay Area photographer specializing in 360-degree photography. I'm with my co-host, Rob Moroto, up there in Canada, who is a specialist in architecture and real estate photography. This month, we have joining us two, two guests. First, Shaman Qureshi, who is a nightscape photographer and an amateur astronomer. We're going to find out how that goes together up there in Calgary. And to round out our three and a half Canadians today, Christy Turner, who is also a night photographer. She also every other kind of photographer, but specializing in night photography in guess where? Calgary, Canada. So before we uh, get going, Rob, shall we take care of the business part and thank our sponsors? I think we really should, you know, right, because we can't actually do this without our wonderful sponsors at HDR Soft. And I actually couldn't have a business or a life, really, without their fantastic program, Photomatics. And for anyone out there that is wanting to know how to use that for, say, something like, eh, I don't know, real estate, I've got a course out there. Check it out. But if you are getting Photomatics, highly recommend getting the full bundle with the Lightroom Batch plugin. You'll love it. You'll enjoy it. And it is so much fun. Uh, to play around with. So thank you, Photomatics. Thank you, HDR Soft. And I've, definitely been, I've definitely been binging the Lightroom batch plug-in as well. This man has been a really big in, uh, improvement on my real estate photography. And I just realized a new parallel just now that, hey, I'm not sure. I, I'm sure we would both have businesses, but it would be different. I, w I started out and Photomatics back in the early 2000s made, really made it possible for 360s. I wasn't going to like the scenes. And, uh, and we probably this podcast wouldn't have started the same way either without that sponsorship. So I just no. realized a new uh, parallel there. So this month we are talking about the Northern Lights, Aurora Borealis. And That's so right. we have experts here who are not me, and I don't think you really too much. No. But why no. don't you tell us about our guests more? Right. Okay. So here I am. I am on Facebook quite frequently. And it just happens to be that Shaman Qureshi, I've known him for other reasons because he's also the owner of a very, very successful real estate uh, management company that looks after rentals. And so him and I, naturally, we became friends on Facebook. And then I started watching his Facebook uh, page. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing these things that are just mind-blowing. These things are the Aurora Borealis. Did you know that it's not just an Aurora Borealis? There's an uh, Aurora Atlantis as uh, well? No, no, Borealis? it's like Australia. Yeah, Australia. Like Australia. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's so cool. And so I, as soon as I saw that, I got hooked. And then I got this app called the Aurora app. And then it keeps on binging every once in a while saying, oh, tonight there's a KP5. And guess what? You have a 30% chance of seeing this if it's not cloudy. I'm like... What the heck's a KP5? So because of that, I had to ask Shaman and Christy, who both live in my hometown, kind of, uh, Cal Calgary, Alberta, which is usually nice and cold in the winter, so you can see a lot of these things. They're both here to tell us about what the what's up with the Aurora Borealis. So uh, first of all, Shaman, I'd like to welcome you to our show, and Christy, as well, I'd like to welcome you to our show as well, and... Uh, I'm so excited so much about for, this. So much for ladies first, right? <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, guys. This is great. I'm um, very, I have very limited knowledge on auroras, and uh, I mean, I'm going to find out today how much, whatever amount of uh, nighttime photography experience. Well, I'm going to see how much that applies to it because it's a really interesting subject. You already brought up one of the things that has that. There's not only northern lights, but there's southern lights as well, and yeah. um, and. I found that interesting too, while I was kind of looking at my general Aurora knowledge today. <laughs> so I didn't know it really either before just today. Yeah. So, um, where do you, uh, well, let's start there with what the heck the Aurora is not from a photography standpoint, but 
I know that everybody who doesn't know is going to first go, okay, I know the Northern Lights. We all, I think, know that usually cool green effect. But who wants, to, who wants to share the short version of what does it come from? <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Jim. <laughs> okay. um, thank you. No very raising much. hands here. Just go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, guys. This is uh, this is a real honor, and um, I'm always happy to talk photography. So uh, here we go. Um, people often ask, where do Northern Lights come from, or what causes them, and ultimately, how do you predict them? Um, and the real short answer is that the sun, being a giant ball of hot, burning plasma, from time to time decays. So pieces of the sun can come flying off and they'll go shooting off into outer space or if we're really lucky, uh, they'll come towards Earth. And there's often some solar wind that comes along with it. And when the magnetic sort of polarity is correct, and that's not a 100% of the time, then the northern lights are caused because the Earth's magnetic sphere will defuse that hot plasma, ultimately because we don't want our planet to blow up. Um, <laughs> and one of the um, byproducts of that geomagnetic process is that electricity gets created and it sort of hovers typically around the north and south poles, um, about 50 to maybe 500 miles above the, the Earth's atmosphere. Huh. I don't know, Christy, does that kind of make sense? I was going to say excited charged particles. So yeah, you gave the uh, the, the extended version, which is great. I feel so like what, you would know better than me. We should name the name. We'll name this podcast episode um, "Excited Particles." Nice, <laughs> um, but it's funny. Like, okay, so the idea of, like you said, the sun is decaying, and every once in a while, a part of the sun breaks off and hurls towards the earth and you said if we're lucky it'll hit us <laughs> well, it's not like a chunk it's not like a maybe rock, not right? in, the, a... in the carrington sense like the, the carrington event but <laughs> right but no that's that's super cool okay so that's all right so now we know what makes that kind yeah, of can i effect. ask one one thing yeah. i was i was already wondering and i saved the question why only at the poles huh um it's a function of the geomagnetic pull, um, and it's probably a little bit more complicated than we would have time to get into on a uh, one-hour podcast. Yeah. But um, if you think about it in terms of a magnet, when your magnet is, po is pointing towards another magnet with a similar polarity, it repels. Mm -hmm. um, and when the Earth and the, the solar wind stream or the CME or the, the chunk of the sun that's coming have that repelling factor, um, then the diffusion and ultimately those um, excited particles will be drawn through magnetics to the north and south poles. Okay. Once again, does that does that seem true to you, uh, Christy? I, I feel like yeah. So, to, like basically, when we're seeing a show at our latitude, the aurora australis is getting a similar show on on their side of the world. So. It's pretty cool because we'll oh, both that be the... experiencing simul like simultaneous activity. So is that always or almost always? Like that's because that solar wind is coming and it kind of tends to get attracted to both poles and it doesn't get attracted to like just one. an expanding rubber band, yeah. Oh, oh cool. Interesting. And then the yeah. more like charge that, that the... Um, whether it's a solar wind or a CME, it's like turning on a spout of uh, t turning on water in a sink. The circle is small, and then the more charged it is, that circle gets wider. Therefore, the spread of light that can be seen grows as well. Okay, okay so if you're if you're in um, South Africa, or Argentina, those places, then you ha then the stuff we're talking about applies just about as much as the northern hemisphere. Huh. Uh, more like Tasmania and Australia, yeah, yeah. those those places. Yeah, I... Now, you know, you made the water analogy there, and the only thing that I keep on thinking about it with water and and polarity and northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere is the toilets and how they spin one way in the northern <laughs> and the other way in the southern. Does that have any? Does that have an effect on the on the the lights? <laughs> yeah, Aurora go the other way. <laughs> that's the science I haven't delved much into myself. I don't know about you, Shaman. <laughs> I feel like that might be a wives' tale, and there's really 
no way for anyone with a day job to figure it out for sure. So. <laughs> well, the yeah, water thing's true, but well, let me ask you this then: the when you're up, when you're in the northern hemisphere here, is there a a pattern to how it moves across the sky that's always uh, by rule? Like you know, the sun moves, you know, what east to west. The, sh the show will always be brightest at local time midnight, wherever you are. Hmm. I like how you call it the show. <laughs> but yeah, can you can you like predict the movements by that it's going to go this direction in the sky every time? Or is, is that a thing? Well, it, it naturally comes from the northeast and rotates past us in a, you know, a constant rotation. So okay. there's no diversion from that, really. So most yeah. likely in the southern hemisphere, it comes from the southwest then? I'm just guessing. That's a good question. Yeah, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I hope to find out someday. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just to add to that, when... Um, when we see these apps that are telling us that there's, you know, a strong display, um, there doesn't really seem to be much of a difference in the geomagnetic data uh, between day and night. The only difference is that it requires darkness for the human eyes to be able to see what's going on. Hmm. So technically an Aurora can be raging uh, for 24 hours a day, but it would only be visible right. to us during those times when it's dark. And as you know, um, the spin of the earth kind of creates darkness at a certain time and, and um, sunrise yeah. at another time. It, it varies depending on uh, where you are. Cool. So then you've mentioned apps. Are you using something along the line of a photo pills kind of apps or do you have something more specif uh, specialized or? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Christy. All you, of the above. Uh, I use like almost exclusively Space Weather Live app. Um, it's Writing the that most down. reliable. Um, I don't. I'm not a big believer in KP as far as like what you're going to actually see. It's more other. The other data is more important than that KP index. From what I can tell, I mean you can be KP seven but seeing nothing. So, right. I mean it is nature. It's volatile, but uh, yeah, Space Weather Live is my go-to app. Okay. I haven't okay. heard of that one. Space Weather Live. Yeah, because I've got the, yeah, I've got the Aurora app and it's just always, always, it'll be raining and I'll get this notification. And I'm just like, I'm missing it because of the rain. And I think that's part of my curse for living out in Vancouver Island now rather than, uh, <laughs> than Calgary. So, Rob, just so you know, it doesn't matter what app you're using, that curse of having a great show beneath the clouds is something that's consistent all across the board. Oh, really? Yeah. It sort of seems like Murphy's Law that... Uh, you get a great show is cloud. raging, but we're covered in smoke or cloud. So, oh yeah, the smoke is just—it has been horrendous for the last little while, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we, we yeah that. we got mm. yeah we got the northern northern Alberta wildfires going, and they there was there were days where it looked like post post apocalyptic uh, scenes, and it was just brutal for uh, anyone out here. But yeah, it would be uh, awful for. The, hey, speaking of. Nice guy. Huh? Speaking of the scenes, this might be a good time just to mention to listeners that um, assuming that Christy and Shaman, you guys are going to send me a few photos, I'll put them on the, the blog post for the show. So sure, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you're out there listening uh, and you're not driving or whatever, if it's safe, take a minute and uh, go to the show notes. And um, uh, it'll probably have to go to the photo focus page, but we'll put some of the favorites. Like my, my pick from the ones that I saw today which one of you was it actually? Uh, it was the, the, <laughs> the Aurora looked like a Phoenix shaped bird. I'm like, wow, like right away that one just jumped out. So I'll make sure, um, well, I'm asking you now, can you send me that to put on the, <laughs> on the post? <laughs> um, and then, uh, I don't know. And so anyway, check out, check out the work of Christine Shaman because that's why they're here talking about it. And a little bit of proof about <laughs> why am I listening to these guys? Right. And um, uh, you got any uh, oh. favorites, Rob? Oh, and definitely. And you know what? If you're if you're on Facebook, check out their Facebook pages as well because uh, it or like them, find them, uh, try and friend them. And uh, I think they're friendly. Uh, and just very friendly. <laughs> check it out because it's so so cool. And here's the thing that I found about the Northern Lights that really appeals to me. If you think about like the number of people that have gone out and shot these, uh, what was it, the San Francisco Bridge? The Golden right. Gate? The Golden Gate Bridge. Okay, mm -hmm. everybody shot it, and everybody shot it from pretty much the exact same place, and it doesn't really change very much. And after a while, you've seen 
10 of them and you get kind of bored of them. I don't get bored of watching the Northern Lights because they've always changed and they're always different. And you can get them from so many different places. And people get really creative with their photos and I love it. Yeah, Shaman has some beautiful photos of like the composition he does with something in the foreground. I'm a, I'm a fan, so I'm happy to meet him here on this podcast. He's got some well, beautiful thank work. you, Christy. Coming from you, that is indeed a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I noticed something about the some of the images that some of them are like you mentioned with the foreground item, a foreground, and then the the aurora in the background, and then other ones are they feel like you're looking directly up. Is that the case? Yeah. Um, like the Phoenix one you're referencing is likely one. I mean, if you're pointing straight up when there's like what, uh, you know, Corona going off overhead, that's what you'll get. And, mm. um, those are the, the best shows for sure. And, and can you do that from Calgary or do you have to travel North? I think the luck, the fortunate, we're in a very fortunate geomagnetic latitude for whatever reason. Um, we get multiple opportunities a year, um, providing we have clear skies, that is. But uh, um, enough so that we have the luxury of finding, you know, pinning locations and finding things to come return to and build into our photos later. So and then if we want to, you know, if it's going to be an extraordinary show, we'll head west towards the Rockies and get the, you know, beautiful mountain lakes reflecting the lights or we can go towards the Badlands and, you know, get, you know, it looks almost Mars-like with the terrain. So we're super fortunate with what we have here in Alberta. Is the Badlands, isn't that um, South Dakota? <laughs> we have them too. There's okay, Dinosaur so Provincial uh, Park, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And is it's that, extraordinary I'm, I'm, at night. I don't have a map in front of me, but is that part of the same Badlands? Does it, Or is it just different no. places they've named the same thing? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I think, uh, well, we call them the Badlands. I don't know if they're connected. Shaman, what do you think? I have absolutely no idea. Uh, <laughs> I think there are other reserves that are referred to the same thing because, you know, we have one of the world's largest collection of dinosaur remains that have been found in Alberta, and there's a beautiful museum here. So we certainly know what we have. Um, but, yeah, they look very, so I've driven through the Dakotas and seen their beautiful Badlands as well. So I guess they're, 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 they're probably a phenomenon people, they're, that occur all, all over, you know, there are people out there that know the geography laughing at me now because now I look I know. at the map and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, no, you have to cross. Well, obviously North Dakota to get there. You're but, bringing uh, us down to land Montana. here. We're back up in the skies usually. So right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So forget I said it. <laughs> now talking about these image, uh, talking about these images, like there's some like serious gear that goes into this yeah. kind of stuff. Like uh, Shaman, I remember in one of your Facebook posts, you had this thing that it, it almost looked like a beer keg that was stuck on a <laughs> tripod, and it. I'm like, what the heck is that? That thing is huge. Like, you need to work out every day just to be able to lift that dang thing. Like, what was that? Uh, that was a telescope or a deep space imaging uh, rig that included a telescope and a whole bunch of other things, um, all of which, as you accurately point out, are very heavy. <laughs> um, and I'll, 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 we'll post a picture for those that are listening at home or whatnot that maybe want to see what we're talking about here. Um, but that's something like a 6,000 millimeter focal length camera at least in SLR standards. Um, and it's not an effective tool for auroras. Uh, more often than not, what will happen is I'll take this thing out into the middle of nowhere and start imaging an interesting galaxy or a nebula. Um, mm -hmm. And then out of the corner of my eye, the incredible happens. It just all of a sudden this aurora pops up and sometimes there's dancing pillars and pinks and purples and um, it makes for a really good foreground element, and uh, it's one that I often have with me. So <laughs> that's probably um, that's probably the story behind the shot. I, I, nice. Yeah, so, I so then I guess like like Ron was saying in your uh, intro there, you're uh, a astronomer plus you're an aurora photographer. So I guess when you go out and you've got this thing, the six thousand millimeter uh, telescope that. If you're out there, you can shoot the galaxies, but on the off chance that there's an aurora, well, bonus, you get to shoot that as well. Yeah, and, and it's sort of, we, we, we kind of touched on it, but um, when we talk about Northern Lights or Aurora, the process of getting the picture is as much of a thrill as the actual picture is itself. And I think that's something that's consistent with storm chasers and probably a lot of your landscape photography type listeners. Hmm. Um, 
But you know, you're often driving sometimes an hour, sometimes more, sometimes four hours to get to the right spot. It's dark, it doesn't have light pollution, and ideally doesn't have any annoying photographers in it either. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, the ones that photographers. The ones that are shooting up with a flash. <laughs> yeah, um, or worse, with their headlights on. Headlamps. Oh, jeez. Oh, um, oh. But uh, it, it's a it's a fun process, and that that's all part of the experience that um, that most Aurora chasers are interested in. Wonderful. So, Christy, then I'm assuming that you're not using a six thousand uh, millimeter uh, focal length for uh for for stuff what what would you recommend for this i'm my next purchase is going to be a star tracker because i'm really i've seen like shaman has some photos where it looks like he's doing deep sky and then there's aurora happening and it like colors his whole image and it's beautiful you have to delve into his work to see that but um i i'm i also have a special lens um that's actually called a spectra lens on loan from uc berkeley um, okay. I work with a, a physicist there, and it's to photograph a phenomenon that occurs with the Northern Lights um, called STEVE, which stands for Strong Thermal Emission Velocity Enhancement. And so my rig set up, I have two cameras going, usually one's running a time lapse and then this one, and it's a big attachment with a slider, and I have to have a special um, stand for it to support it once it's mounted on my camera, and it's it's kind of jerry-rigged, and it once flew on one of the space shuttles, so it's it's pretty cool. <laughs> Oh wow! Wow, <laughs> but it's heavy, and I perma I const I mean, like most photographers, I have like permanent back issues all the time. But small price to pay, I guess, for the shows <laughs> that we get to see. Nice. Well, we did a we did a whole talk about uh, keeping yourself in shape to avoid those kinds of problems right. from carrying gear. Hey, so what? Um, now that we've heard all the cool stuff that none most of us are never going to have, what do we need if we wanted to venture out? And go if I wanted to go up to uh, Calgary or North, and uh, what would I? What would what'd you say we do, you would need for sure to not miss out, but uh, just not all of the uh, high end items. Well, um, <laughs> to jump in, really, everyone's, all everyone's so polite. See, very Canadian. Oh. Everyone's very polite. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm one of those it's people that can get going and, and very much hog a conversation. So I'm aware we all can, we all can. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, really the, the basic sort of the least that you would need would be a very sturdy, solid tripod. These aren't the kind that you would buy at a, mm -hmm. a big box store, um, but something that can maybe hold up in the elements, bearing in mind that there's wind and ideally uh, none, but rain and so on. Um, and the next thing would be a wide angle, fast lens. Um, my favorites are in the 20 to 24 millimeter range. Um, and um, when you pay enough, you can definitely get them at, at very low F numbers or very big apertures. Uh, 1.4 is great. There's some at 1.2. Um, I understand Nikon came out with a 50 millimeter 0.8 recently. Wow. Uh, yeah, and so the focal length is important because the more of the sky that your camera can see, the better. But it's equally important that the lens have that aperture rating that allows a lot of light into your sensor quickly because the auroras are moving and you don't want to sort of blow them out or get them blurred by having a, a really long exposure that um, doesn't allow the camera to pick up any of the details. Uh, the that being said, too. sorry. <laughs> Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, a, a lot of people's phones right now are also able to pick up. I mean, if you've got a little stand for your phone, you don't even need to have the, the heavy gear if you are if you just want to see what your phones are capable of doing. But obviously, um, Shaman mentioned like the tripod and the other lenses. I mean, it can go from the very basic to the very elaborate. So it's okay. the, the I remember uh, for a while I was doing full moon shoots. Try approximately once a month and uh and the moon's moving pretty good so you have to ha can't have a really slow shutter speed which you don't really think about so is the aurora similar like uh what shutter speed are you looking for to get it get the capture the movement without the movement i think it's probably very much a personal preference thing based on the gear that you have and so on but if i'm shooting an aurora or i have my camera focused on the sky on an active night 
I'll almost never let it go for more than two or three seconds with a preference to about one second. Oh. Um, I've got some, some colleagues or friends that take amazing shots and have shown me some amazing work where they've looked at it and, and taken 10 and 15 or even 20 second shots. Um, but on those nights when the auroras are really strong and they're dancing, you lose a lot of that uh, detail and it kind of makes your final image less interesting. So hmm. if someone asked me, I'd say shoot for about five seconds if you can. So you're not trying to freeze motion like a person walking <laughs> or the, the see the moon is moving it enough where I forget now, but I want to say something like a thousandth of a second or something. You, you, you actually do need that speed. Otherwise it's a little blurry. Could be more. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but the, is the Aurora, the idea where you're kind of doing a slower, you're, you're cap letting it move within there to get that silkiness or are you trying to capture the, what am I trying to say? You're trying to stop the motion. <laughs> Yeah, there's different sort of approaches that one can take. And, and with a longer shutter speed, you kind of get that um, that dreamy, more silky look. And right. if that's what, what any given person is shooting for, great. Um, and when you have a dancing aurora um, and you get a good quick shot that freezes the movement on it, that's when you're going to have a picture that pops. That's, that's when your image goes viral after you post it online. So what, what kind of, what did you do for the Phoenix one since people are going to see that? Um, that was uh, almost an accidental shot. Um, I was using a ball head, which I almost never use, and I forgot to tighten it. So it kind of made the camera drop on me. Cool. Um, it kind of feels like you're zooming, doing that zoom trick. It's kind of what it looks well, like. <laughs> like I said, it was entirely coincidental. <laughs> um, and it sort of picked up some of the trees on the bottom right hand side but uh, yeah. that was pointing up and that was a 0.5 second shot uh at f 1.4 and iso 500. wow well, i know i know i've got a couple of lucky ones where i didn't plan it but once i saw it i was like wow that's a good shot and if you're saying that's what happened here that's a good one because the trees really work i think they're a i think they're an important element yeah. in the, in well the, like Kind like, of like it looks like the birds kind of looking down at them. You know, it's very, very for cool. sure. Yeah, Christy mentioned it, but that's called a corona, and it takes a very strong display before you'll ever be able to see one of these. Um, and so it's almost always directly overhead, and that makes it very difficult to find a foreground element unless you can maybe prop yourself and your camera mm -hmm. underneath a tree or right, right, right. Uh, find a find an owl or something. <laughs> <laughs> well they that's what they say you know so many photographers when you talk to them about this you're like especially when you're starting out and you haven't done it a lot yourself and you think oh this person has all this amazing work and how do you do it how do you do it and they'll tell you they'll be like i'll shoot all day and i'll be happy if i get one i want to show <laughs> so it you know i don't want to feel like i uh always have to get the shot even though we always want to but yeah it, can, it sounds like you're saying that too there's a lot of luck involved a lot of um a lot of uh you know there's the more you try, the more luck you have. Determination <laughs> kind of, uh, and patience for sure, right? Yeah. yeah I'd, I'd Where luck to... meets preparation. I mean, yeah. Try, what am I? <laughs> yeah, luck meets preparation. You get the, you get the shot. <laughs> yeah. I'm so, curious to hear Christy's comments on, on shutter speeds and some of her techniques because she, yeah. she does amazing work. And I've seen a lot of it. I've been a follower <laughs> for a long time. And, um, I think we can all learn something by maybe hearing some of your technique or your secret sauce. <laughs> I'm using usually using the Tokina like 16 to 28 or I have a 15 to 30. But lately I've been shooting with a, I just picked up a 50 millimeter 1.4 and been just shooting with that on a second or third camera just to see, you know, especially with this show um, I've got in the background of my picture here, but the co those coronas you're talking about, the colors that those lenses pick up is awesome. And I'm actually also running a GoPro most of the time, the GoPro 10, I think, and just, you know, for time lapses. Uh, so sometimes I'm running from tripod to tripod, just trying to keep it all going. But yeah, and I, I shoot, my sweet spot is usually between five and seven seconds. I often start off around 60 ISO 1600. Um, I might pull it down if the show is really vibrant and, you know, lots of visible pillars. And yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm changing all the time. And, you know, I really enjoy the way your photos look. And I'm going to be um, looking closely at some of your settings because I'd like to, I always like, like you said, you can learn from somebody, another photographer constantly. So 
Now, we've talked a lot about the, the lenses and the apertures. What about camera bodies? Do, like, I know that there's astral bodies out there that are specialized for astral photography. Do you need one of those? Or is it a regular DSLR okay? Do you need medium format? What's your take on that? Christy? I have a, a Nikon mirrorless and I have um, two DSLRs and then a, a GoPro. So uh, kind of a mix. I'm planning to acquire a second mirrorless. The difference in weight is what's driving me towards that technology mostly because um, when you're running with two or three cameras, that makes all the difference. But um, yeah, <laughs> so I'm kind of running the whole span there. <clears throat> wow. And Shaman, what do you use for your, for your camera body? Um, I hate to say it, but it's it's sort of this evolution where I'll drop a huge amount of money into one brand and then for whatever reason, a year and a half later, decide that I want to switch. So um, I basically have everything. I've got uh, <laughs> I've got a, a Sony A7R5, uh, or two of them actually, um, and that's sort of my, my drug of choice right now. Um, I've had the Nikon Z series mirrorless, Z7, and um, before that I had some Nikon D850s, uh, and I was I was really happy with those. And I think that, to be honest, it doesn't matter. There's mm -hmm. a lot of upside and downside to each of the big three, and you might not be able to get everything with every camera, but. What, what one brand is lacking, uh, it makes up for in some other area. And uh, they're all like that, and they're all different. So. I love Canon, but I shoot with Nikon. I mean, I used Canon early in my photography, but it's just I ended up um, get, acquiring gear from a second hand initially from a girlfriend that was shooting Nikon. So once you start building your lenses and stuff, I, I got stuck with, with and I'm happy to be stuck with Nikon, but you guys fit right in. I was, when we started out, I was saying that one of the rules is nobody, if you're really passionate about my brand rules and yours sucks, then you don't belong here. <laughs> I, I, I just, I'm the same way. I just, uh, I just feel like they all there's we're in 2023 and already for several years, any camera that you get, like if you're someone who's starting out, like we, Rob and I talk to people who are starting out pretty often and you're like, don't, stress about which one you're going to get something that's going to take care of it. Now, if you're in a certain situation, you might need this wide lens, whatever, but yeah, just, I wanted to, I was thinking about calling the show, the poly cameras photographers. <laughs> I don't know if it's, I don't think it would fit in very well. Oh, we, we do have a love hate relationship with a lot of our gear. Don't we <laughs> camera swingers? Yeah. Oh my God. I've, I've got, I've got such a specific reason that I might actually be making a big change here pretty soon, but it's such a, very specific thing that is going to save me a ton of time. It might be worth it. So who knows? Um, so, yeah, good. Rob. Okay. So uh, we were talking about the shutter speeds around seven, uh, five to seven seconds being a nice sweet spot, having those uh, wide lenses, uh, nice open uh, apertures. And then you, you mentioned that you were talking about like uh, the ISO around 1600. Now, 1600 that's with a lot of the newer cameras that's actually pretty good there's not there's not as much noise as there were like you know back when uh you know 10 years like cameras from 10 years ago 1600 iso was almost unusable but now they're very usable in these newer cameras but there still is noise and considering that you're shooting in low light conditions uh is noise reduction something that you guys think about is that uh something that's very important and if so what do you guys do with it Christy? I address a lot of that in post. Um, if if it's you know I I'm I've I'm happy with the settings I'm using most of the time, but there's definitely times I've had to crank it up when you know activity sort of peters out a little bit or you know. Uh, but most of the time I just make some minor corrections when I'm um, processing the photos and and that's it. Or I may on occasion do it in camera as well, but. Yeah, I should just say before Shaman, before you go, I was just wanted to mention for people that are a lot of the audience is um, starting out and um, noise is exponentially more in underexposed areas. So naturally, night photography, it's going to become an issue more often. So, yeah, Shaman, what do you do? Yeah, that that sort of grainy, annoying artifact that shows up in, in your perfect shot can be really yeah. frustrating. Um, one of the techniques that I like to use doesn't even involve software or the post-processing um, realm, 
but instead uh, stacking. So that means taking a similar picture or identical picture over and over again. It can be one, it can be five or 30. Um, and then with software, Photoshop does it, and there's probably half a dozen really good uh, apps out there that will do it, like Starry Landscape Stacker, Starry Sky Stacker. Um, Photomatics yeah. will do that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, that's, that's one of my insider tips is if you're doing night photography, let's just say there's not moving things. You can just take multiple shots at different exposures or not and just um, average them out because you're probably going to I'm probably stealing this from you, but noise is random. Well, so, that's exactly it. And um, you can sort of average out the light value of each pixel and the more images you have, the better. So if you're shooting a foreground and, and you're a northern lights photographer, that's a great way to get rid of it. To the point where noise isn't really an issue that I that I think needs to be be addressed with northern lights photography. Hmm. Um, the sky, on the other hand, is very different because we talked about how you kind of want to keep your exposures relatively short, and as a result, some of the other settings, the ISO and, and whatnot, might um, might kind of create that noise problem. So one thing that, that I like to do is to turn on the long exposure noise reduction. And what that does is it takes another shot with uh, the, the shutter sensor closed somehow. Um, and that tells the camera exactly what true black is. And then it kind of does a reduction algorithmic process that gets rid of a lot of the noise right there in the camera. Huh. Um, and then when you go in to, to edit your pictures, uh, you don't need to maybe punch the sliders as much as as uh, you would have otherwise had to do. Um, we're talking about AI, and I have to say, I've never really been that impressed with any of the AI denoising technology out there. Um, you know, you've you've been out all night. You might have one shot, and you just got to edit it before you go to bed. And then you go to run this program or this script, and it can take five or seven or ten minutes. And that's not specific to Lightroom. Uh, Topaz has a, a similar sort of product. Um, and I'm not a big fan. I, I use them when I feel like I need to, but that's relatively rare. Huh. Well, this kind of photo that you guys are creating is not the type that you would normally be go home, quickly edit, and be happy with it, right? I feel like this is something you might spend a little time on to get it right. <laughs> and those kinds of things might come into it. Like maybe you even denoise differently and make a few versions and combine them something like something like that that's kind of the sense i get from well you know, for even. sure um almost everyone i've i've spoken to kind of implies to me anyway that when you're doing aurora photography you almost have to edit two separate images even if it's just a single frame where you edit the sky in a certain way and then you edit your foreground in another way yeah and it does sort of run the risk of looking fake if you overdo it. But it's something that, that most people with, with uh, a good set of eyes can, can tweak in a way that they want. Um, and that helps. Yeah, that, usually then, you select the sky and then invert it and then edit mm -hmm. the foreground using that exact technique he's describing. So, yeah. And then yeah. I would use one of, the, one of the many AI item removal options that are out there. I would try those to get rid of all the other photographers, and I would be disappointed, and then I would have to go and clone them out myself. That would be my <laughs> workflow. <laughs> now, I just thought of something here. When you're shooting there, and you've got your camera pointed straight up to the sky, how do you meter that? Because the regular camera meters are going to be like, oh, this is really dark. You know, you got to do it for 30 rough. seconds. You just got how, how do you do the metering? What is a meter? <laughs> yeah. What? I, I called it, right? You just got to know. You just, it's either you what? know or trial and error. You, you gig a shot. You see how it goes. Just like when I'm bracketing, Rob, if I'm in a home or out or something and I just run a bracket, I think it's right. If it's not quite right, I just make an adjustment. Like Bobby Flay cooking. He just cooks for a while, take, taste it, and adjust it. A lot of it boils down right? to preference too, right? <laughs> like it's just what you get used to in your part yeah. of your workflow. So, yeah, I think like Christy will will probably concur here that the majority of of Northern Lights work or Aurora photography is done in manual mode. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know, it, it becomes a numbers game. You take enough shots, sooner or later, one of them is going to be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Have you guys ever gone out and done uh, light cut uh, lightning photography? 
Oh yeah, lots of we get some we have some beautiful storm skies in Alberta and weather's changing constantly around this time of year especially so Yeah. Yeah, it's a, one of the, it's it, I was kind of getting a sense for that with the aurora like with lightning you just leave the shutter open for a while see what you get. Click 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 sooner yeah. or later yeah. you've yeah, got exa- it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Of the so, spray and pray method, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's okay. if you're not metering, then you know, are you're looking at the back of the camera, seeing the image preview, and are there any tips that you would have for our listeners who are wanting to go out, like what they should be looking for on the histogram or anything like that? Oh, for sure. Um, one of the biggest things that new photographers ask about is literally how do you focus? It can be very difficult. Um, Oh, Most of the time, it'll be very difficult to fo- to use the autofocus function in the middle of the night unless there's a giant, super bright star that um, a very fast lens might be able to pick up. And you're shooting uh, wide open, right? So that's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, the way to do it is is through the back LCD screen. There's back button button focus and so on. But um, you know, you kind of zoom in on a star and you. You adjust until the star is at its smallest uh, diffraction point. Right? When it's at its smallest, and you can usually tell with your eyes, uh, well, then that's a reasonable indication that your stars are in focus. Um, the problem is the auroras are about 50 miles away from Earth or maybe 500 miles away from Earth, and some of those stars can be 30 million light years away. So, so what's the hyperfocal uh, length there for 30 million? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it depends what you're shooting, I guess. <laughs> if it's an alien, you're going to need a lot. Um, well, and you're and you're never sure exactly how far the aurora is, even if you're looking at it. Am I right that you don't really know how far? So you couldn't mathematically focus. I can't even yeah. remember how to do that, but I know there's a way. <laughs> Photo kills does it. Um, that's okay. Calculations. And okay. the other thing is to remember that even a, a static aurora is actually moving. You just might not be able to see it with your eyes. So. Um, even if you're in perfect focus, there's a chance that it's all moot and it doesn't matter because, you know, even on a three second shot or a one second shot, if that thing is moving, yeah, it's mm-hmm. going to blur your edges and you're not going to get that sort of end um, result that could be a really crisp shot. But you can trial and error it and pretty much get a focus early on in your spraying and praying. Then once you get a focus, you can kind of lock it there, right? Yeah, exactly. Pretty sure. As the night goes on, you might find that the temperature changes a couple degrees, and that can have a bearing on focus. Oh, but, you know, 99% of us take these amazing pictures, and we share them on little three-inch screens. Yes. On our uh-huh. yeah. And if your focus is off a bit, you know, it just doesn't really matter. <laughs> How would this have been done be- pre- uh, before digital photos where you could look at the results right away how how could this be even really done i have a mark on my infinity on one of my couple of my lenses like so that i can feel it at night and um that's you know that's that's what i use or i you know i'll find something like a, a farmhouse in the distance and focus on that and lock it and that sort of thing but i'm having to bring my as I get older, my reading glasses along just to make sure I'm 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 locked in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a good idea, like a tactile thing for night photography, so you don't have to see. That's a really good idea. Or if, what if does Infinity work most of the time, where you can just tape it? Because like one of my one of my lenses, I just tape it because I use it for only one thing. That's a tough one. Um, I, I've tried it and I've gotten away with it at times, and I brutally miserably ruined shots in the past Hmm. Um, and i think infinity uh by the lenses standard can actually change a little bit depending on the outside air conditions so you you lock it down at infinity and there's no there's no guarantee that your perfect focus or imperfect focus will will be consistent throughout Um, i'm constantly checking as i'm shooting like throughout the night i'll you know you know because i'll move the camera and get a different you know foreground or something anyway and then i have to i just want to make sure it's still locked in so you're a responsible night owl you're doing it the right way not just setting it and forgetting it yeah nice (laughs) i have done that and lost a few images then as a result like shaman mentioned so 
Well, I just wanted to point out, make a clear point about photo pills for people out there that don't know it. I, I really like that app. It is like 10 bucks. It's an iPhone app or I suppose, assume Android. I don't know. I use but, it on Android. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. And they have, they really cover the whole thing. Like there's the uh, photographer's ephemeris. That's a good app as well. But I really just feel like photo pills. They really nailed it. We got to get them on Rob. It's like these kind of, they, they seem like real nice uh, guys from, they're from Spain and they, um, they do a lot of content about how to go get some of these epic shots. So Great. we got to really have them on. Maybe we could have this group and with one of them when we get closer to the uh, eclipse, because Ooh. I think we should start preparing people for Totality. the eclipse this time. Yeah. We could have a meetup. Exactly. So when you guys are going out shooting, like you said, you're, you may actually be driving out an hour to maybe four hours to get to a destination. Uh, Christy, you mentioned that uh, the best time is going to be around midnight, where it's going to be the brightest. How long are you out in the field shooting, typically? It depend Here, it depends on the time of year. Like in the summer, it doesn't fully, you know, at the peak of summer, it doesn't fully get darkness here until around 11 p.m. So, and then the sun's coming back up just after 3.30 kind of thing. So there's a shorter window there, but... Um, Pretty much in like in the winter, you know, from o October onwards, as soon as it's dark, after, you know, until um, you get tired or the show is over, so to speak. <laughs> hey, I'm, uh, we're kind of getting near where we should wrap things up pretty soon. I have a couple of remaining questions I wanted to throw in there. And I'm, I'm hoping listeners are wondering the same thing. <laughs> That's why I'm asking. Is number one is um, some of them, I, I don't believe I've ever really thought of auroras being purple or other colors than green. Is that, first of all, if you want, is there an explanation for it? But, um, but more importantly, is there a way of predicting that? Is that something that's, that you would know is coming or is it also get what you get? What you get? Um, it's speculative science, I think. And, and um, Christy, I'll let you comment on this and speak to this matter because I feel like you know better, but um, <laughs> the, the, the different colors come from different uh, gas byproducts that are kind of floating around in, in the uh, magnetosphere. Hmm. So that would be hydrogen, that would be sulfur, and um, that's sort of where those bluish cooler tones come from. Um, they're not always visible to the human eye unless they're very strong. And as a result, uh, it takes a very big, very strong, powerful display, and they don't come up very often. So uh, when you see them, they're very, uh, they're very beautiful, but it's kind of like predicting the northern lights. Technically, it's possible. You can follow the data, but there are no guarantees. Not a perfect science, yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, ha I, I have, uh, I'm in a like 24-hour chat with a whole bunch of really hardcore Aurora enthusiasts, and a couple of those guys are space physicists, and they get talking, and I barely understand what they're talking about. But a lot of the, I feel <laughs> that the density, um, the data for the density, with respect to the winds coming in from the sun is plays a role as far as what colors might be visible but like the show we had in just a few just i think it was end of march march 24th you could see pinks and reds with your eyes um once you were you know, you know used to looking at the sky i i actually am hosting a couple ukrainians brought them along and everyone was gasping and of course i'm the only one taking the photos they're just watching so it, it wasn't just some, something you're seeing through the lens in, in those kinds of cases and being in the solar maximum phase that we are in entering into that can only get better in the coming years, hopefully. Oh, and how, what, tell us about that. That's a trend that goes over years. Yeah, we're, we're in the next two to three years, we will be at solar maximum for this solar cycle. And um, we can expect, you know, quite a few, uh, large aurora shows and a lot of you know activity from the sun hopefully some x-class flares that don't damage earth <laughs> <laughs> oh i think i did hear something about somebody was saying that that kind of thing could happen anytime <laughs> like oh. things that damage the earth i'm like what i don't know if that i didn't know if they were serious or if it was just a I don't know, youtubers yeah look up the carrington event it it knocks it knocked out power um for an extended period of time. I mean, it can so definitely bring down signals. In fact, there's like, you can be tuned to a certain frequency on an AM radio and when there's certain activity, it actually, it, it actually affects the radio itself. So the transmissions and yeah, you can get completely mired in all of that science for sure. It's fascinating, but. Wow. 
Yeah, the night that Christy was talking about, um, that was, if I recall, that was a G4, right? That's about mm. as strong as I've ever seen. Um, I saw some pictures of, of very light, very diffused auroras coming from northern Texas. Mm -hmm. Wow. Are we yep. talking about a solar flare? Is that the... No. I think it was a co combination of like um, the... The, the transients point where we are with the sun and and a flare that was incoming or a cme of some sort yeah oh dear well on that note i have one other question and then uh, if you guys want to hit me one but i thought there was one more that i think is important is for those of us that might want to go and get kind of these shots uh you guys are in calgary which doesn't seem like it's that far north when you're talking about uh, a show that happens over the poles so what are the advantages to being kind of where you are or farther north or what do you, you guys have any um, tips on that? Yeah, it's, it's sort of a fine balance in the sense that the further north any given photographer is, uh, in theory, the closer they are to the action and they'll be able to get the better uh, Aurora shots. The problem is that concurrently as you go north um, in summertime when it's, you know, not abrasive outside, uh, the nights get shorter and shorter and shorter. So there's sort of this, this common idea or generally accepted statement that the Northern Lights are only a thing in winter. And that's not the case. They're, they're going year round. It's just that in winter, the nights are so much longer. So in Calgary, there's like this perfect balance where you can get the Northern Lights and you can see them year round, but it's also not you know, 40 degrees below zero, like it might be in um, Anchorage or Yellow. White Horse or something, yeah. <laughs> One of those places where, you know, you have these raging, crazy Aurora shows almost every night. They have like a default Aurora there almost. Wow. And is it any is it any better on this continent than, say, you know, Finland or something, which I think is the most famous for viewing it? I've yeah. been to Iceland and I loved, I mean, it was beautiful there and they definitely have a default Aurora, but I mean, um, and I would love to be in Tromso, Norway, but I'm just as happy going to Alaska or the Yukon, you know, if I'm really looking to get close. Yeah, not to get too technical, um, but when we talk about the North and South Poles, there's the magnetic pole, which is sort of a little bit different from the nautical pole or the one that you would see that your globe might spin around on. Um, and that actually makes North America a lot better off because the auroras are further south than they would be on the other side or the Russia, Europe side. Hmm. Well, I, I feel like, I don't know about you, Rob, but I feel like these guys of Guy and Lady have uh, kind of opened up the idea of aurora because I, I think of it as something that's wow, maybe a, a fantastic trip someday. I'll go up to Norway, Finland to get it. But you're saying it's quite accessible as long as you're pretty far north or south. <laughs> if I was betting and planning a trip, I would plan during the fall equinox period, like mid to late September into mid to late October. And you'd almost, you know, if you gave yourself a week in that time frame, you'd probably catch some good activity. Really? Now, are there, are there, I know that in uh, when you go up to Yellowknife and things, there or um, there are tours where people will take you out to go see the Northern Lights. Do you, are there any resources like that uh, in your area? There are certainly photo. I've actually taken photo tours with other photographers, like um, a local guy here, Neil Zeller, does tours, and um, but you know, it's also I, it's just as easy to plan your own. And, you know, find an Airbnb. The accommodation is key because it can be pretty, pretty pricey in some of those more remote areas. But I think, it, you know, rent a car and, you know, go and head up to Anchorage, you'd probably have good, great luck, you know. Hmm. Interesting. So, so for anyone out there listening that wants to grab a uh, <laughs> grab a rent a car, get up north to see the Northern Lights, then... Uh, Summer equinox, take a wide, wide lens with a very small, well, very wide aperture and a very sturdy tripod. Anything else that you guys can throw in there for advice to uh, enthusiasts? 
charge your batteries and get lots of them. There's nothing more frustrating than, than running out of power while there's this crazy, yeah. awesome, beautiful display blowing your, your mind. One of the, I feel like that's an advantage the DSLRs still have is the batteries really last so much longer. And I, I consider that to be one of the main things. So yeah, just think about it. if you have a mirrorless, you, you order extra and charge them up. Keep them yeah. warm too, right? There's a great group too on Facebook called Alberta Aurora Chasers for the, you know, and there's actually the Upper Midwest Aurora Chasers in the U.S. And um, if any, if there's any activity, you, you'll they'll, they'll start a thread that night, and you'll you'll know where to be and and where to go more or less. So, okay, wow. give us the link for that so that it's in the show notes. Yeah, that, yeah, I've been uh, following that, and it is when all of a sudden. Uh, I'll get notifications like, oh, there's somebody posted to this group. Somebody posted to this group. And it's like, what is this group that they're posting to? And that's exactly it. It is the uh, the Alberta Aurora Chasers. And when they get going, they do get going. Uh, it's pretty cool. I love the I love the fact that there's a, such a huge community of yeah. photographers that are doing this. And at the same time, it seems like looking at their photos, they don't really run into each other very much. They're all over the place. And they're all getting these amazing photos, which are fascinating to see we got a lot, a lot, a lot, of, lot of land to work with up here so yeah, a lot of space up way. there <laughs> yeah and a lot of rural roads that uh, you can drive a little bit faster on <laughs> so, so we have one more let's um move on to give us some picks and um we'll say goodbye after that yes that we is have right. started a tradition brand new tradition of giving our youtube picks for the month on this show and um i'd like to go first because i'm off topic <laughs> okay i couldn't you know i was today i was thinking who do i want to recommend photography wise that i haven't recommended already and i just didn't come up with any so the 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 channel that's been uh uh making uh my family and i fun having you know, what i'm trying to say loving watching is called the y files I just got a reaction <laughs> from one of those audience members, but it's a uh, really fun where they, he goes down a kind of a rabbit hole. He and the fish is the sidekick go down the rabbit hole about things like time travel and different um, anything from conspiracy theories, series, conspiracy theories to um, just urban myths and stuff like that. And some of them are so much fun the way he presents them. And then he, when the one, the way he goes back and says, all right, is it true or not? And he goes through and talks about what he's found, whether it's real or not. And, good entertainment but it's not photography so <laughs> let's do let, hey rob you want to go last since you can bookend as the um co-host sure. and Sounds um good. let's uh christy what's your pick um i i'm gonna shout out to a very talented uh, uh, female photographer out of alberta her name is monica deviant she has a youtube channel she's the bravest of uh, northern lights photographers i know if there's a show she's alone on top of a mountain you know uh shooting time lapses in the middle of you know she's she's super brave she's got amazing work um she leads workshops as well but uh her content is is beautiful so i'd love to uh direct you her way wow so not only is she carrying up uh this incredible gear up a mountain but she's doing it in the dark to Hello. get up there Hello. Yeah, and, she, and i mean she's a scientist she owns she she's a pole fitness dancer She's uh, an amazing photographer. Yeah, I, I'm a fan for sure. Wow. Nice. Hey, Shaman. Shaman. Um, I am going to go with Astro Backyard. Um, it's a guy named Trevor, and I don't know him. I, I merely follow him. Um, he's out of Toronto area, somewhere maybe one of the surrounding cities. And his whole thing is that he takes these stunning absolutely stunning deep space images of nebulas and galaxies and moons and whatever comets um, but he does so using techniques in gear most of which is probably very very expensive and it's all done in his backyard in a light polluted big city of maybe seven million people um, okay. so the work is, is is amazing in its own right but when you think about some of the factors that he's got to deal with to get these images it becomes uh Pretty cool. And a lot of his videos are, are kind of just showing you some of the experience that he goes through to capture those. Um, and I got to hand it to the guy. He works hard. Wow. <laughs> wow. It's impressive. 
Nice. And then for wow. me, I've actually found that okay. So there's this um, there's a ski hill right outside of Banff. And it's called uh, well Banff Sunshine uh, Res Resort, and they have a webcam, and they have this webcam pointed up at the sky, and if their northern lights are out, you can actually see it live on YouTube and watch these northern lights from the ski hill. It's phenomenal. I had it on uh, the other day while I was doing processing. I had it streaming on one of my monitors while I was working on, on the other one because it was just, it was so pretty just watching the northern lights uh, live. It was, uh, it was really, really, really cool. Nice. Well, there you have, as we say, cue the music. And let's go around one more time and tell everyone where to find you. Let's go ladies first this time. Christy, what do you want people to know about you and where to find you? I have a Facebook page, Christy Turner Photography, and my Instagram is Aurora Chaser YYC. Aurora Chaser. It's the new Storm Chaser. It's the Aurora Chaser. Shaman, what about you? I am on Instagram at Shaman Koreshi, and drop me a line. I'm happy to chit-chat about anything photography-related. Careful what you ask for. <laughs> <laughs> Rob. And I can be found at Rob Maroto on both Facebook and Instagram, and of course online at robmaroto.com. And Pep? I also have the vanity website, ronpepper.com. Um, hey, Bay Area photographer, if you are one also, get in touch. Let's network. If you know someone that needs one, let me know. Otherwise, you know, I'm not promoting a course or anything like Rob. <laughs> but Rob's course is great. I've learned stuff from it too, so check that out. And with that, hey, I think, I mean, I don't know about everybody else, but for me, I feel like Aurora has been a little bit demystified as far as how to capture it and what needs to happen to make that happen. So I appreciate that. I hope, uh, hope everybody listening does too. And I know you can't go shoot the, I know listeners, you can't go shoot the Aurora now, but my recommendation is always try to get out and shoot something whenever you can. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks for the Q&A show. Adios.